dedicated to uh, science and reason, and uh, we, we like to promote secular values. And uh, we like to think that we are uh, continuing in the tradition of, of Darwin himself and, uh, and bringing forth an event like Darwin Week to, uh, to, to, to sort of challenge um, our, our assumptions and our, our ideas about the world around us. Um, so I, I, you know, I hope that you will all notice uh, the rating cards that were uh, hopefully placed in your seats before the talk. Um, if you could uh, fill those out uh, as, you, uh, as we get done here and, uh, and, and, and set those on the table over there, those, uh, those help us to make sure that, that we're giving our, uh, our uh, audience what they, what they want for Darwin Week, basically. Um, all right, so our next speaker is, uh, our next speaker has been a member of the Department of Philosophy and World Religions here at the U University of Northern Iowa since August of 1999. He teaches courses in Biblical Studies, World Religions, and Humanities. Dr. Atkinson has three degrees in Biblical Studies, has actually participated in a translation of the Bible, and has excavated widely in Israel at Biblical sites. Presenting his lecture, The Text of the Bible, Do We Have the Original Scriptures? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kenneth Atkinson to Darwin Week 2011. Thank you all very much for coming. I'd like to thank the free thinkers and inquirers for arranging this event. It's always one of the highlights of the year, and I was told to keep it um, short, about two hours. That's a half time discussion. The discussion is usually the best part of these talks. And the topics, if you look, they're kind of very diverse this year, but I think one thing they all have in common is the idea of very much of critical thinking. And I think there's no greater example of that the past few centuries than Darwin. It doesn't matter whether you believe or not in evolution. I think that reading his book, especially The Origin of Species, will really teach you how to think critically. And some of you may know that Darwin originally uh, studied to be a minister, kind of left back. But he brought his academic ability and what he learned from his scriptures, looking at the world around him. In his writings, he looks at things as small as earthworms, the monkey evolution on a tiny scale, grand scale. And also his book, The uh, Voyage to the Beagle, is really a great classic about his trip around the world, where he started to look around the world and come to his theories. And today, what I was asked to do is kind of use a scientific method, uh, ask the question, do we have the original text? of the Bible, and it may sound like a dumb question, a lot of people say, yes, I have a copy. You, know, you go to a bookstore, here it is, the Word of God, the Bible. Uh, but often people don't think, where did this come from? What is it that people like myself who are in the studies are translating when we talk about the Bible? And much of what I'm um, going to discuss today is also relevant to other texts. So I don't know many of you take humanities, one for your LAC requirement, and most of you study the Gilgamesh epic, or Homer, the Iliad, and so forth. You look up philosophical texts, and your teachers will go into the problem of recreating the original texts and manuscripts, so forth. So this is not just unique to religion. And, and just a few problems of reconstructing the original text of the Bible. First, the Bible has a very long oral history behind it. Just like many texts, like the Gilgamesh epic, if you take it humanities, it's been told, retold, it's changed, it's adapted. So before it's been placed in writing, we've lost the oral history. So in a sense, there really is no such thing as the original. And this is especially true of the earliest books of the Bible, especially like Genesis, they've been told and retold many times as legends. Um, so when we say the original, we usually kind of put in quotation marks for that reason. Um, and we know from scholars who study oral traditions, uh, texts like the Iliad were memorized. Uh, but every time it was told, it was changed, adapted. And if anyone's in English, you study writers like Laurie and Perry, who study uh, bards in former Yugoslavia, looking at how they told stories in like the Iliad. Every time they tell it, it would differ. The basic frame stories there. And so the original story is the early part of the Bible. The oral tradition is lost. Sometimes you can kind of get a sense of the oral um, tradition behind the Bible. It's still has elements of oral tradition. And this semester I'm teaching Gilgamesh epic, a lot of students said there's a lot of repetition here. Why do they keep repeating? That's a hallmark of oral tradition. And you see it in the Bible often. Stories kind of repeat themselves. And they often change during transmission. So all we can deal with is the written text of the Bible. And we always recognize there's an oral legend behind it. And this is also true for the New Testament. Um, does anyone know how many books the New Testament Jesus wrote? 
Zero. Zero. So, um, yeah. so how many books did Jesus write? Zero. So people told his stories orally, they transmitted, then they're placed in written language. So obviously things changed, adapted, and then people added interpretation to stories of Jesus. So even when we talk about Jesus, we can never fully reconstruct what Jesus said. We have what people believe he said in the Gospels. And another problem of the original text, and this is one that surprises people, there are different versions of the Bible. And there was never one single text, the Bible. If one time, let's say you have a manuscript, like the book of Genesis, someone wrote down what was Genesis. A scribe came along, copied that, they made changes, they adapted it. And over time in antiquity, from pretty much all the books of the Bible, there were many, many different versions. And so in Jesus' day, there was no such thing as like the Old Testament. There were many, many different versions. And over time, Jews, Christians will debate which text to be canonized. And one of our famous examples is the creation account, um, Genesis 1 and 2, where sometimes the Bible um, they had different accounts. They put them side by side. And Genesis 1, you have one creation account, Genesis 2. And these stories are both sacred. They're very different, so they put them in. And you find a lot of uh, duplicates in the Bible, with Abraham passing up his wife as a sister and his son. And a lot of stories where Moses will do something, then it's repeated. And oftentimes the names are different. Like Moses' is father-in-law, Jethro, the various stories. Them. And then other stories, it's the same story, but he's named Ruel, the location's different. Sometimes it's Mount Sinai, sometimes it's Mount Horeb. And from a historical point of view, it shows, one that shows that some of these scribes were very honest with stories. They had conflicts of stories, different versions in their texts. They did not always harmonize them. They kept them in there. So sometimes we can get a sense of um, the sources behind the text, how they be pieced together. But oftentimes, the different versions of the Bible differ. When we look at manuscripts, there are many different manuscripts of Genesis. The, the manuscripts we use in our Bible were canonized very late, about 1,000 AD. When scholars, we go back, the further and further back we go, we find this great deal of textual diversity. And this is because in antiquity, we think of the text as something fixed. But in antiquity, the text was alive. It's spiritually true, but scribes did not have a sense of the text as fixed. You could change the depth. They didn't see anything wrong with that. You um, adapt it to your community. And for example, most people are familiar with the Ten Commandments repeated twice in the Bible. And one uh, uh, number is Deuteronomy. One's a little bit longer. There's a Dead Sea Scroll, which contains one of the oldest copies of this, where they've combined um, in Deuteronomy elements from numbers to kind of make a mega copy with much longer explanations. And so probably the scribe realized a lot of people don't have the other manuscripts, so they're kind of putting things in, merging, condensing, adapting. So these texts were very much alive, so we can never get back to the original text of the Bible, because even all the oldest manuscripts we have are very, very different. They all contain different readings. Sometimes it came to stories of one that's different from the other. And another problem is, uh, the material. The oldest copies of the Bible were written on parchment, and this is uh, one of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dates to, this one dates to about 100 uh, BC. In part, uh, this is made of papyrus, which is a reed that grows in Egypt and north of Israel in Lake Hula. And it's very, very fragile. You can see this manuscript. It's uh, fallen apart in the bottom. This is rare to have a text preserved as well. It's kind of stitched together. And the ancient texts, they're copied on papyrus. They have to be copied very frequently to survive. They're just rolling and rolling. They frequently fall apart. And we always see a lot of repairs in these manuscripts. And parchment animal skin is a little more durable. And you can see this is kind of nicely written text. They survive very well. But in early days, it's very limited. The technology is not as efficient. And if you notice the handwriting, because this is Greek and this is Hebrew, the, these are actually very good, neat handwritings. When I um, started biblical studies, I always heard this myth that scribes were very, uh, had neat handwriting, they trained to write. 
good, clean script. But I thought the working manuscripts, that's not true. Some of these have worse handwriting than I do. And you can't tell what they're doing. And if you imagine this is a text, say like Genesis, and you have to, you have to copy by hand. But obviously, that's going to be quite difficult. And you can see how people make mistakes. You're in, you have to think also it's important for physical transmission manuscript. You have a piece of papyrus in front of you, you have the text, then you have like a little quill, and you have the ink, you're dipping back and forth, your eyes going back and forth. So we see a lot of errors. And a common one is where people will skip the line and it begins, especially like the word and, lines down, it begins with the word and, your eye kind of skips. And it's common to find manuscripts with a couple lines missing. And then scribes later will correct so it's a myth that scribes me. These are all me. But I've worked in manuscripts just so horrendous. I, I can barely read anything. Even blowing up the computer, you sit there trying to think of this is the world's person saying. And if you're copying that manuscript, sometimes you have to guess. And so, so oftentimes, uh, mistakes not only deliberate, but sometimes frequently accidental. And uh, ancient books are quite fragile. And we're used to dealing with um, you know, physical Bible, a book on paper that's very, very durable. But um, we have to consider antiquity. Books, it's very difficult for them to survive. And the libraries, at the great library like, in, library in Alexandria, Egypt, about the third century BC, invented the concept of a classic. Because the problem they had was these books were literally disintegrating the shelves as people used them. And they couldn't copy them fast enough to keep everything Intact. And so they invented this concept of canon, a list of books they thought everyone should read, uh, which is kind of the ancestor of liberal arts education today. <laughs> <laughs> so you take humanities and see this list of books, like why are we reading these dull, boring books? Well, these libraries, they kind of invented the idea. And they tried to pick the best book of each literary genre. And if you look at the surviving historians of antiquity, like Thucydides, uh, Livy, Livy, Tacitus, and so forth, you find that they all kind of overlap a bit, and that they all pretty much kind of use earlier books. And that's not accidental that library of the past had to select the best books to survive. These were the best books. They kind of incorporate knowledge of earlier books. So you make certain of these are copied. And it's not that a lot of people think books in antiquity were destroyed or declared heretical. It's usually if people didn't copy it, they just disintegrated, disappeared on the shelves. And so the Bible early on uh, went through a very rigorous process of debate of what should be in the canon, what should survive. And the problem was, if you want to copy the books of the Bible, the original text is lost. And <coughs> people in biblical studies like myself, we ideally want to try to reconstruct the original text, but we really can't do that. It's lost. We have copies and copies and copies. And all copies, contain mistakes. And if you look at text on the uh, introductions to Old New Testament, they'll talk about text criticism, give you kind of these rules that scholars use, and make it sound very scientific, but it's really not. It's mainly guesswork, I need to say that. Okay. that uh, they'll say, like, obviously, the earlier manuscript, you would think it's better. But that's not always true. Some scribes who copied earlier manuscripts were sloppy. They made mistakes. Or they may have copied from a manuscript that was terrible. So you can't always go with the earliest manuscript. And there's one manuscript in the New Testament. It's very, very late, but it's one of the best. It has many of the oldest readings, and we know why, because the scribe had copied and put a note. And his note says that I found this very, very ancient manuscript in my library, and I had copied it. So this was apparently forgotten in you know, that library, monastery, someone found it. It was very, very old, so you have kind of see yeah, but old manuscripts aren't always the best. And even the oldest manuscripts of the Bible all contain mistakes. And they're copied from earlier texts. And uh, another thing we do is kind of look at general rule of thumb is the more difficult reading is generally correct. <coughs> and it scribes oftentimes um, would correct a text of the Bible. It seems very difficult. And for the Old Testament, it's in Hebrew, Aramaic. It's a very archaic dialect sometimes. People would update the language. And 
Uh, sometimes they would have a manuscript, they would think a text is mistaken, a passage very difficult. They may inadvertently correct it, so they're changing their text. Um, so generally the more difficult, but not always. And we have to kind of you know, debate that among ourselves. And um, so it's really guesswork. We look at the text, and, and I hate to say this, we have all these manuscripts in front. We look and see, I think this is the original text. I'm going to put this one for this verse, for this verse, this one. And most translations of the Bible are done by committees, usually odd number of people, so that you don't have a ton. And so it's, and this is not just for the Bible. You read like Homer, you read anything. The same thing. Um, scholars have to do. But with scripture, obviously, because of religious focus, people think it's the word of God, um, not as so many people are aware of this. And I urge people, any Bible you have, read the introduction, they'll usually point you to a critical edition of the Bible. And if you go to that, they'll give you the methodology. And I once asked a scholar, Bruce Metzger, who's one of the people responsible for producing the Greek New Testament, I asked him, what do you do when the committee is equally uh, divided by reading? He said, with all seriousness, we just look he said, sometimes we don't know, we just have to guess. And so it is kind of a haphazard affair. That's, that's kind of the secret of the biblical stuff. A lot of the scholars don't want you to know. We really don't know what the Bible says, and we're often guessing. And one problem is the language. The Old Testament is Hebrew Aramaic, and ancient Hebrew Aramaic had no vowels. And that's true of a lot of Semitic languages, like Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, ancient Arabic. And so if you can imagine a manuscript with no vowels of your textbook, trying to read that or even copy it. And um, Hebrew is an inflected language. You add consonants, the beginning, ending of words to indicate grammar, case, so forth. So um, when you read an ancient text without the vowel pointing, you would almost have to know what the text said to read it. And uh, if you mispoint it, you could mispoint the word, uh, have the incorrect grammar, the tense. You could take a grammatical uh, case as part of a word, uh, come up with the wrong word. And this is also true of the Quran. We say Islam. The Quran had no balls. And it's very, the Quran is a very cryptic text. You almost have to know what it says before you read an unpointed text. And so this is not just true for the Bible, true for the Quran. And the Jewish community realized this was a problem. And it's not until about between 1789 and 30, a group of scholars called the Masoretes create a system of all points. And what they did, they did not want to add to the text. So if you look at Hebrew manuscript, you see little dots, dashes to indicate the balls. That preserves the oral tradition, what they think is the way the Bible is pronounced. But by the time they did this, there were about four gutturals that had dropped out of Hebrew, uh, roughly by the time about Jesus. Day. And so many of their points are incorrect. And we actually looked at earlier translations of Bible languages like Greek, uh, especially, for the pronunciation of names. And like the city Sodom and Gomorrah. And he would Sodom Amor, because the A sound used to have a G sound. That dropped out of Hebrew by the time about Jesus uh, was born. And oftentimes they made uh, mistakes and mispointed the text. And there's an early translation of the Bible to Greek called the Septuagint, done beginning about 250 BC. And we look at that, and oftentimes they pointed the text differently than the Masoretes. And Greek has vowels. And just to give like a small example from Deuteronomy 24, the consonants in this verse, uh, transliterated English as KYR, um, you could do a kind of punch, uh, put the vowels two ways. Uh, you should not oppress the work here. Or a slightly different uh, point of the vowels, you should not keep back the wages of a man. It's this case, it's kind of the same sense, but it's a little bit different. So which one do you pick? And when scholars translate the Bible, we look at the Masoretic notes, we ask, is this tradition correct? Is the vowel pointing correct? Sometimes we say yes, sometimes no, sometimes we look to early Greek translations, sometimes Latin, because early Latin translations are closer in time than the uh, Hebrew vowel pointing. Sometimes they differ. And this is a very 
minor example, but sometimes the differences are major. And also uh, deal with grammar, tenses, so forth. Um, so this really complicates our effort to reconstruct the Bible not having vowels. And this is to other texts written like Hebrew, Aramaic, ancient Arabic, uh, Syriac. And another thing, there are many, many different versions of the Bible. The Dead Sea Scrolls contain our oldest copies of the Bible, dating back to the oldest, probably about 200 BC or so. And uh, the different copies of the Bible they have are often different from one another. Some are very similar to what becomes a traditional text reflected in your Bible. Others are completely different. And that may sound odd, but in Jesus' day, everyone had different copies of the Bible. So he went to one synagogue, their copy of Isaiah was a bit different than the other synagogue or Deuteronomy. And that didn't seem to bother people in antiquity. They thought the message is sacred, but you can change, adapt the text. And there are a lot of um, passages in the Old Testament where it's, the text has become corrupt in all the manuscripts. We don't know what it says. And just a couple examples. If you look at 1 Samuel 13, 1, this is what the Hebrew says. Saul was blank years old and he came. Dan Duran, he reigned, he reigned blank in two years over Israel. Obviously, something's dropped out. In Hebrew, you spell out numbers. You don't have numbers. And if any Bible has a number, they just make it. We look at all the translations, they don't have it. It was lost so far in antiquity that most translations left it. Some later translations, well, the text will kind of put it in, but we have no idea. <coughs> and sometimes things have dropped out. In one example, if you read the story of 1 Samuel 10, 27, 11-1, um, this is a story where Saul becomes king, not Kashiki, and the Ammonites all since attacking the village Jabesh Gilead ready to poke out their eyes, and you wonder, what's going on here? And Saul rescues them. And the Jewish historian Josephus, who um, was born about the time Jesus was crucified, wrote a book called The Antiquities, which is a history of the Jewish people. And it's kind of like the Reader's Digest version of the Bible, which was a big flop. Where if you're familiar with, familiar with Reader's Digest, they condensed big books, and they condensed the Bible, and took out the repetitions, and people were upset, so it never sold. And he kind of harmonized the Bible for pagans, retells the Bible, copies from it extensively. And he has a whole paragraph in there that's from the Bible that's missing our Bibles. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, the oldest copy of Samuel, this paragraph is in there, Hebrew. And if you look at the New Revised Standard Version, they placed this portion of the Bible back in there. Because you can see how a scribe's eye is just skipped from one part of the text to the other. And so nearby standard version, the Bible is actually a bit longer than others because of this. And in many other places of the Bible where things seem to drop down, the text will become garbled. In 1st, 2nd Samuel, Hosea are very corrupt in Hebrew. There's a lot that's become garbled transmission, dropped out. And much of it, we just have to guess what it means. And for the book of Jeremiah, we have two versions. One is the version in our Bible that's the standard Hebrew version. It's Canonized. It's very much full of repetitions. And the Old Testament and the Septuagint, the Greek translation, is much shorter. It's much smoother text. And scholars for a long time debated well, uh, did the person who wrote the Septuagint, the Greek translator, shorten the Hebrew text? Or was the Hebrew text somehow someone just took passages, kept repeating them? And we have a copy of Jeremiah, the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Hebrew text matches Septuagint, it's shorter. It appears probably what happened is that um, Jeremiah is a big book, and for liturgical purposes, people would repeat various things. So you would read a little section worship, a little section here. And scribes, at one point, canonized the longer version, but the earlier version is probably shorter. So why don't scribes um, put the earlier version in a Bible? And this is kind of a secret Bible translation. Oftentimes, we think we know what the original text is, but we have tradition. People are used to a longer version, and Bibles have to sell, publishers have to sell them to Christians who can read them in worship. And if you have a Bible that's going to cut out a big part of Jeremiah or change the text of the Bible, people won't buy it. So, unfortunately, um, no English text of the Bible is completely accurate, and largely because of economic reasons. And 
Another example is kind of interesting Deuteronomy 27, where the ancient Israelites are told to set up an altar on Mount um, Evil, which is the left mountain. And to the right is a mountain called Gerizim. And Gerizim is sacred to a group called the Samaritans, which still exists today. They're about 650 as of last count. And the Samaritans believed that early on the Israelites were told to worship there, and they still worship the Mount Gerizim. But in the standard text of the Bible, they're not. The text says, in a place, they build an altar in evil that says, a place God will choose to build your temple and eventually next to Jerusalem. And if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, chapter 4, Jesus talks to the Samaritan woman, and the law she points at the garrison. They're debating about this. Um, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the oldest manuscripts of Hebrew, it's Mount Gerizim. So most scholars think that Gerizim was originally a sacred place. The text was later changed when it moved to Jerusalem. And the Samaritans are correct at this point. So most scholars would say, really, we should go with Gerizim, but because of tradition, we kind of go with um, the standard text, evil, that Mount Evil is just kind of a minor cultic importance. In the New Testament, a lot of people think the New Testament were in Burma, Brown. We have about 5,700 known manuscripts. They're always discovering new ones. But none are identical. In the Jewish community, roughly about 100 AD, they started to select manuscripts uh, to be canonized, saying this is the one we'll use for this book, this version of this book. About 1,000 AD, they put the vowel point. So um, our Bible is going to translate from the traditional Hebrew text that has the vowel points going back to 1,000 AD, that roughly reflects the text canonized about 100 AD afterwards. But surprisingly, the Christian community never chose one copy of the Greek New Testament, which that kind of seems surprising. So there is no official text of the Greek New Testament. Everyone's different. And all contain errors, and most manuscripts contain deliberate changes because of theology, especially with the debates over Christology. Scribes would change the text to make it say what they want for theological reasons. And this is kind of a page from the standard Greek New Testament. And this is from uh, 1 Thessalonians. And here are the Greek text. We notice down here, all these are little abbreviations for manuscripts with differences. And these are just the major manuscripts. There's an appendix in back, more manuscripts. Then there's a big book that tells you all the variants. But there are actually more words down here in the New Testament than up here. And if you go and look at this text, the standard text is it's called the Nestle Allah Greek New Testament. And it has a copyright on it. And copyright means that an author publishes a book, they produced its original work, they own it. If I want to, I can't publish it without their permission. If I want to give huge citations, I have to pay them. So the Greek New Testament actually has a copyright on it. And if I want to, publish a commentary, say like First Thessalonians, have the Greek text next to it. If I use their text, I have to pay them to get their permission. And if I want to challenge their reconstruction of the text, they can say, no, you can't print my text. You can only print a little bit. And the Society of Biblical Literature recently uh, hired a scholar to publish a new Greek New Testament. But because of copyright restrictions, he could not use this edition. And he had to carefully go through public domain Reconstructions of Greek New Testament to show that he did not use this to reconstruct his Greek New Testament so these people wouldn't sue him. So there is a lot of money in the Word of God. And <laughs> even though these are produced by, published by the German Bible Society, American Bible Society, mm -hmm. nonprofit groups, they do make a lot of money from this. And the scholars who control this um, carefully keep access to the text. And I, even once, was a meeting where one of the People put this together, signing his name, and someone said, "Aren't you adding to the Word of God?" Oh. No, that's a revelation, a curse. And he said, "No, look, I wrote it. Right here's my name. Look, the copyright. I own this. I wrote the Word of God. So God didn't write it me." And, and um, in this text, it's in the 27th a revised edition. The 27th edition has been revised, I think, 13 times. So they're always changing, adapting. And the newest text, the Society of Biblical Literature. Put out, they have what they think of 500 million years in this text. So we're constantly changing the Greek New Testament, and translations often reflect that. And just to give you a few 
crowds to read and start the New Testament. Like Luke three twenty two, generally most Bibles are saying um, when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, um, the Holy Spirit comes down on the dove says, "You are my Son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased." The best and earliest manuscripts actually say, "You are my Son, today I have begotten." And the author is actually quoting from Psalm, uh, Book of Psalms, the Old Testament two seven from the Greek version, which Book of Psalms, the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And then if you look at the earliest Christian writers when they quote the New Testament, this is what they're quoting. But we know that scholars change later of the debates over Jesus' divinity, that many Christians early on believed in what's called adoptionism, that Jesus was a human when he was baptized by John the Baptist. The Spirit of God came into him. Then he became divine. Then when he's on the cross, uh, he says literally in Greek, my God, my God, why are you leaving me behind? That the Spirit of God left him. So a lot of scribes changed texts to avoid adoptionism. And it's pretty much universally regarded by New Testament scholars. This is what we should translate. But most translations say this because this is what, <coughs> what people are used to. And publishers would be upset at changing the text. So um, the most you'll find is usually that in a, so reading the bottom of the text, say some manuscript read. And sometimes it's very hard to figure out what the text is. Like 1 John 5, 6 is from the King James Version, which is celebrating its 400th um, anniversary this year, which is the most beautiful but not the most accurate translation. But most translations have something like this. This is he that came by water and blood in Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood, and it's the spirit that bears witness. And some manuscripts say through water and spirit, through water and spirit, through blood, through water and blood and spirit. Blood and Holy Spirit. And we just kind of have to guess which one. The uh, describe short of it, the add. And sometimes people, we have evidence of people adding on to the New Testament. This is a passage, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, 36. Um, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches and saints. Let the women keep silent, for it is not permitted for them to speak, but to be a subjection. Just as the law says, but if they wish to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. What did the word go forth only from you, or has it reached you alone? And if you read Paul's letter, it's, that sounds very similar to passage 1 Timothy, which says very much the same thing. A lot of scholars don't think Paul wrote 1 Timothy, the big son in his name, um, which is very common antiquity. People write letters in the name of someone else. And, but if you look in the manuscripts of 1 Corinthians, it's in different places, the manuscripts. It moves around. And even where it is placed now, it interrupts the flow of Paul's argument. If you move it, you wouldn't miss it. And we can trace its history. It was put in at some point under the influence of 1 Timothy. It moves around. But then if you read 1 Corinthians 11, Paul assumes women are praying and prophesying all the time. The only thing he's concerned about is proper dress for men. So you can't say Paul's for women preaching, praying, prophesying, and he's against women praying, preaching, prophesying in the same letter. Now, obviously, there's something's wrong. There. And Christianity, like Jesus and Islam, um, you know, have kind of something we sometimes call aggregation. Scott, you take later texts and all my earlier ones. If you look at Romans, Paul's undoubtedly the latest letter he wrote, chapter 16, he's mentioning men, many women who had churches, and he calls them <laughs> Julia, chief among the apostles. So Paul's latest letter, he assumes women are preaching, and conducting church services. But then we look at the earliest Christian art and catacombs, we see pictures of women leading services, and early Christian writings. And pagans would even mock Christianity because um, women and slaves in church would have prominent roles, and they thought it was ridiculous, like the lowest and low. And you can see why so many women slaves joined Christianity in the service, you're equal, you're going to be equal in heaven. Life sucks, you go outside the church, you're a slave, you're a woman. But at least for that little bit of time, that's a foretaste of heaven. But over time, the church becomes more in hierarchy, appeasing uh, the Romans. You can't have women in such high places, so letters are written, and people begin to tackle it. That's, and just kind of things in conclusion, the original Bible is lost. And we have many versions of the Bible. And when scholars, when we translate, 
uh, we have all these manuscripts. It's largely depends on the committee who's translating what's chosen. We sit around, we debate. We really don't know, so we say, I, let's choose this one. We have to pick something. It may be, maybe not. And the best readings are often omitted in favor of the best theological reading. That oftentimes, publishers don't want certain things in the text. They're not going to publish it. So the best scholars can do sometimes is put it in a footnote where it's the very reading. And just sadly, no Bible translation is complete and accurate translation of best preserved text. There, um, every Bible translation is really what the people put that translation together want you to read the text. And the really sad thing is, if you really want to know what the Bible says, you're going to have to learn Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, which is a big time commitment, to be honest. And that's true. <laughs> I hate to say that, I wish you could. But I think we have time for any questions or comments? Oh, yes, sir. Among, uh, among the books in the New Testament that are attributed to Paul, what do, what do scholars think today, which of those books were written completely or imposed by Paul? Uh, generally, at first, second Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Romans, first Thessalonians, yeah, Philemon, yeah. Uh, they, there's general agreement those were written by Paul. And it was common in antiquity for people to write books the name of authoritative figure. It, it's, some people say it's fraud. I don't think it's always fraud. If you believe you're inspired, you did not write these books to make money. And if you think this is like in the spirit of Paul or something, you would put his name so people would read it. We have books written by Adam and Eve. I doubt Adam and Eve wrote that. Or all sorts of people in the Bible. And like Enoch, and Noah, different people. So you want people to read it. And uh, some of these are in the Bible, but like the example I showed you, you're going to, 1 Corinthians is clearly written by Paul. But that passage doesn't seem to be Paul. The writing's different, the style. And it would be like a textbook if you put a passage of Shakespeare in there. It's like, this is a little different writing style. So um, the later letters even kind of tone down Paul, especially with the hierarchy, the role of women. And so the New Testament is kind of, we kind of have a mixed bag. Letters by Paul and letters attributed to Paul. And most scholars would not attribute to Paul. Oh, yes. My understanding is that the New Testament writers use the Greek translation of the Jewish Bible. And our current published Bibles have the Hebrew translation yes. of the Bible. So we're actually not looking at the same... Bible that the early Christians looked at. Yes, the Orthodox Christians used the Septuagint, the Greek translation. So they're consistent because the early church pretty much always, almost always used the Greek translation. And the Greek translation oftentimes is very different. That um, sometimes they updated it for um, their time. They had to create a theological vocabulary that uh, people could understand. It's mainly produced Alexandria, Egypt, and they were very influenced by uh, philosophy, uh, Plato, and they kind of created the vocabulary that becomes the New Testament vocabulary. And sometimes it differs. For example, like in Matthew, where the prophecy of the virgin birth, um, the virgin is in the Greek translation, but in the Hebrew text, it's not a virgin, it's not a prophecy. So that prophecy only works in the Greek text. In our English versions, we use the Hebrew text but sometimes with theological translation, some Bibles will change the Hebrew to match the Greek so that the prophecies match. So um, our Bibles, they generally use the Hebrew, but not always. Sometimes they use the Greek when publishers, translators are uncomfortable and think something should be in the Greek. So we're not really consistent. And uh, many biblical scholars say probably to be more consistent if you study Christianity, should use the Greek translation because that's what the early church used. And Judaism obviously uses the Hebrew because that's still the living language. Judaism is a language of a religion based on uh, the Old Testament. But if you know someone's Orthodox, they'll, uh, if you look like an Orthodox Bible is translated from the Greek, it's often very different because of that. You spoke about how people in antiquity are comfortable with contradictions within the text. And, mm -hmm. um, could you explain a little bit, if as briefly as you want to, what role the Enlightenment played in the, on the role or in the rise of biblical literalism 
I understand well, that this is the place to. Yeah, in a sense, fundamentalism in reading the Bible is something new. For most of history, people did not have a Bible to read. They couldn't read. And if they could, you did not have a Bible because who could pay for a manuscript to be copied? And it's really not till the printing press comes along and people begin to translate the Bible into local languages like German, whatever, Latin, people could read. So for most of history, people do not have the Bible. And that's why I think there's a lot of different manuscript people. Uh, these were meant to be read orally by someone, so you would change, adapt the text to meet the circumstances of your community. You probably wouldn't have the complete Bible, so you may cut and paste from this book into this. So it's really a modern phenomenon even having the Bible. We tend to think people in antiquity knew it. It's only the elites had access to libraries. If you ask access to a Bible, it's probably chained to a lectern or locked up. It's manuscripts are valuable, people would sell. And it's not to the really enlightenment or Rasmus on it, where people began to look and ask this question, do we have the original text to kind of debate? And so um, it's really a modern phenomenon of biblical studies in that sense, of reading the Bible. So it's, it's relatively rare. So um, most people would hear the Bible orally. And, I tell my students, it really does have an oral quality, all these letters, especially like Paul's letters. People think he's repetitious, why is he repeating? But if you read it out loud, it's much more beautiful. It's meant to be heard orally. So you really can't convey the beauty of the Bible, the Iliad, unless you hear it orally. Uh, but sitting there with a fixed text, kind of looking at these are more modern questions. But in antiquity, people didn't care. It's the message is sacred, but it doesn't matter if the text is different. And they, had, they didn't have any trouble with it. Like the Dead Sea Scrolls, they have all these manuscripts together. They knew they're all different versions of text. They, they didn't care. It's the message is sacred, but not the fixed text. So it's more of a modern um, concept, the obsession with the fixed text we do in copyright. Oh, yes. We uh, have one more question, oh. and I'm going to be selfish enough to ask it. <laughs> uh, I, I, I guess at the risk of getting a little bit more controversial here, uh -huh. is, there a, is there a consensus within the biblical studies community about um, whether the Gospels were written by the people who they're attributed to? Mm -hmm. And if not, whether the people who did write them were eyewitnesses? It, it, there, no book of the Bible had a title originally. And in manuscripts, the first few verses are the title. That's the title of each book. So later on, people would um, ask who wrote the book. So this is true the Old Testament, New Testament. So the open your Bible it says like the book of Genesis by Moses. And that someone put that there later. And people began to debate mainly like second century onward who wrote these books. And they ascribed to the people they thought were followers of Jesus. So like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are very late tradition. So scholars would not uh, say that's authentic. That's just tradition. And uh, we don't think any of the gospels are written by our witnesses. That doesn't mean that some oral eyewitness tradition made it into the gospel. And if you read that carefully, even like John, when people say that, well, there's an eyewitness, if you read it carefully, it seems like he's referring to someone as an eyewitness, like the beloved disciple said this. <coughs> and that really didn't seem to bother the Christian. And Jesus spoke Aramaic, so the gospels are in Greek. And they're written, you know, not all the best Greek, but they're written, uh, the Greeks quite well. They don't reflect like poor Aramaic-speaking people. And so obviously as scholars, we look at the Gospels on the text and we sit around and debate, did Jesus say this, did he say that? We, um, that's where faith comes in. You cannot say Jesus said anything that statement of faith. We don't have other eyewitnesses. And even the other texts we have are much later. And generally we look if um, you can often translate something back to like Aramaic. Say like when Jesus has a pun on Peter, his name means rock. And the pun of Jesus, Peter being the rock of the church, that works in Aramaic, that pun. It doesn't work just in Greek. So, something like that, many scholars would say that's more likely to be an authentic eyewitness. But if you have things that seem to reflect like later Greco Roman culture, it also means presuppose kind of Aramaic Palestinian context. Then we say that's the church. And then the one thing that's clearly added the interpretation, where, um, like, if you read Mark, you have parables, you should know interpretation. Matthew, Luke will give you interpretation. Sometimes they differ. That's obviously the writer's kind of update. So you read the Gospels, you, they're not claimed to present everything Jesus said. It's uh, Jesus, things he said, and their interpretation of Jesus' world in light of Christianity. And so it's many, many layers. So I think we're often trying to read the Gospels as something they're really not claiming to. They're not interested in so much what 
historical Jesus that it's what Jesus said for the community of faith today. So they focus on events like the, the last meal because that's the communion and baptism. So it, it's not, um, the Gospels are not meant to be fair and balanced. It's not like the Fox Channel, no spin zone. <laughs> <laughs> like that. They're, they're biased. They tell you that. They say this is the gospel good news of Jesus. They're out to convince you to be a Christian. So they're not giving an unbiased historical account. So I think we often, um, we read them as if they were historical accounts, and they were never intended to be that. The books are made. There is history in there, but that's what scholars do. We sit around and we argue, did Jesus say this? Did Jesus say that? And we really, we really don't know. If we cannot prove you really can't do this. And thank you all for coming. Hey, I can sense everyone's getting antsy. Just bear with me for one second. I just have a couple quick things to say.